So in this video here, we're going to talk about best practices for model deployment. If you're trained your own custom YOLO 8 model or any of the other Autolytics models, you want to export and deploy it into production. So we have developed the whole model, we have trained it and so on. Now we want to put it out there and do real work in the real world. So need to deploy models. We're going to talk about the best practices covering different deployment environments. So if you want to deploy it on edge, cloud or local environment, model optimization technique and so on, what you can do for that with different frameworks, different export formats and so on for your model deployment, but also just troubleshooting and security considerations when you're deploying your models into production way. So it's just down inside the Autolytics documentation. If you go inside the guides tab at the top and scroll all the way down to the bottom, we have this best practices for model deployment. We have videos, documentation and so on for pretty much all the guides over here to the left and all the pages on the Autolytics documentation. So if you just go up here at the start, we can read about the introduction to basically just model deployment in general, but we already covered that in the introduction as well. So it's basically just how do we take our model and bring it into production after we have done the development? So first of all, we need to have a problem. We have our data set. We can then go in and annotate our data set, train our own custom models. We can then export them and act like put them into production because we need to have a model get outside the Jupyter notebooks. So we have different deployment options depending on your needs and also what you're looking for because there's huge difference between doing it on cloud, on edge devices, or a local deployment. So when we're talking about cloud, could be that you want to host your model on Azure, Google Cloud Services, or AWS. So you can basically just take your model, host it in there. You can use all the hardware. It makes it easier to scale and so on. It's relatively easy to set your models up in there. You can set up whole automated pipelines as well. Then you'll just get an endpoint that you can just send requests to, get the responses back. But once we need to do that, we actually need to take our images, send it to some server somewhere so that will introduce some latency. We can use the hardware, we can scale our models easily and so on. And we can also choose the specific hardware. We can change the hardware, we can scale the resource and so on that we want to use. So it's very flexible and also scalable, but it will introduce some latency. So depending on your application and what you're looking for, could be that you want to run real time computer vision applications, could be some different tracking systems and so on, where you want to have like counting, parking management system and so on, then we need to do it on the edge or on a local environment where we can actually like get this real time performance. So edge deployment could be on jets and nano boards, raspberry Pis, and so on with curls. We have guides for all of that over here to the left as well. So that is actually like just taking data and putting it closer to the resources and also our compute power, which is going to do all the processing for us because then we don't have the latency of taking our image and sending it to a server somewhere. So we can also have local deployment if we have a dedicated computer, could be like a server, on-prem server where you have all DPUs and so on running, then you can just connect the cameras, connect the video streams and so on to that local environment, and then you can process your images there. So edge deployments are the fastest option. Again, they're also on the lower end. Then we have local deployments if you want some more heavy processing on your end, depending on your model, the data that you want to process and so on, and also how many video streams you want to process at the same time. And then if you just want to do batch processing, process individual images and so on, cloud deployment is a very good option. So now we know the different deployment options that we have out there. We also have a ton of model optimization techniques. One of the most common ones are model pruning, quantization, and also knowledge distillation. Pruning and quantization is probably the most used ones out there, and you should definitely explore that once you have trained your own model or using a pre-trained model and want to put that into production and deploy that model. So if you just take a look at the graph here, we basically just have our model before pruning and also after pruning. So what pruning does is that it basically just goes in and takes a look at each individual weight and then it's going to determine which of the weights can we actually like remove from the network. Could be individual weights, but it could also be whole layers. You can go in and specify it yourself. Often you'll just specify that you want to reduce the model weights or basically just remove 10% of the weights in there. Then we act like just have a 10% smaller model. We remove the weights that is not affecting our accuracies because when you're training your models, you will find out that in most cases, you can act like delete 10% of your weights without really impacting the accuracy. Could be that the accuracy is it may be decreasing by 0 0.1 in the mean error position, but could even be that your model generalizes better by using pruning as well. 
So it's really nice to go in and use pruning. You can get faster inference speed, but also a smaller model without really losing accuracy. Then we can also go and do something called model quantization, which is basically just taking the data type. So the precision of our weights, then we basically just go in and quantize it, which means that we just lower the precision. So when we have our original model, depending on how we train it and so on, and the position that we have chosen, we either have it in 32-bit floating point values. So every single weight in our whole model, the, all the YOLO V8 models, all the update detection models, pretty much any neural network out there, each individual weight is represented with 32 bits, floating point value, and then we can actually like lower the precision all the way down to 16-bit floating point values, 8-bit integers, and so on. So it's very common that you take your 32-bit model and then you quantize it down to 8-bit integers without really losing much accuracy. It could be that you're losing a bit of accuracy, but that could be acceptable for your specific application and project that you're doing, and you will be able to speed up the inference speed significantly as well, because again, if I actually reduce it by 3x with the precision here, it will run significantly faster. So we can reduce the model size, it will speed up the inference, and this is very important and a really good step to do. When we both do pruning and also quantization, we won't lose much. If we just do a bit, we won't really lose that much accuracy and we will speed up the inference significantly. So this is very important, a very good practice to do once you want to put your models into production for model deployment. We can also do quantization aware training, which is basically just a method that takes the quantization into account while it's training the model. And also it just knows beforehand that we want to quantize a model and actually reduce the precision could be from 32 bit to 16 bit and so on, or even all the way down to int eight. Even some research is being done all the way down to int four, int two and so on for some of the large language models. So it's definitely very interesting to do model quantization. We also have knowledge distillation here, which basically just means that we have this teacher model, could be a pre-trained model, and then we have a student model that we can then go in and train based on our teacher model. So we have our training data, we train both of the models, and then we basically just have this knowledge distillation in between our student model and also our teacher model, which is the large pre-trained one. So this could be a good practice if you want to deploy it into edge devices, mobile phones, and so on, as you can see over here to the right. Let's now go down and cover some of the troubleshooting deployment issues. If you run into any problems while you're deploying your models and so on, could be that your data is inconsistent, you lose accuracy on your model, you're not really getting fast inference speed and so on. Here you can read about all the most common deployment issues. So first of all, check data consistency. A lot of times we train on a specific data set, we put our model out there, we basically just deploy our model, and then once we get into production, our data is drifting. So that is very common. So we train on a specific data set, probably data that has been generated way before that we deployed the model just for the development phase. We fine tune our model, we do all our iterations, high parameter tuning and so on on the first data set. Then we get it into production and our data has just drifted too much and we haven't really trained our model on that specific data any longer. So definitely make sure that you're aware of that. We don't want any differences in our data distribution quality or like even the format of our data. So also validate pre-processing steps. So if you do any pre-processing, resizing the images, make sure that you feed the model, the correct format, the correct images in the correct format. So if you do any normalization of the pixel values, rescaling the images and so on, make sure they are in the exact same format. You're applying the same pre-processing steps as you did once you trained your model. Then now we also need to go in and evaluate the model's environment. So it could be that you're using some different frameworks for the deployment, TensorRT, ONNX, and so on. So it could be that there are some different versions and so on, not matching the exact same one as you trained in. Then you might run into errors. Could be that the model is not even running, but it could also just be that it slightly decreases in accuracy. So make sure to evaluate your model environment as well. Now we need to go in and monitor model inference. So this is just a very good practice when we do model deployment. We deploy a model and then we monitor it just to make sure that it's act like operating and doing inference as we expected. If it's not, we can always go in, retrain our model. This is just a whole computer vision model pipeline. So we have our data, 
we train a model, we deploy it into the production, we generate new data, we have this whole training loop, we annotate our data, add it into our data set, and then we just have this whole data flywheel where we keep monitoring a model, retraining it, and then we basically just swap it out once our model or data is drifting in production. So also review the model export and conversion. So often we need to convert it or export it into specific formats, which could be causing a drift or something like that, or basically just the conversion process in itself could be affecting the model weights and also the architecture in general. Test of the control data set. Again, we train our data set, we have our validation set, and then we should also have a test set that we can then test our data on, but make sure that we have data consistency still. And if you're facing problems with the inference speed, it's basically just taking longer than you expected. And also when you had it inside your Jupyter notebook. So first of all, we need to make sure that we warm up a model in the first initial runs. Often it has to do a lot of setup and so on, run the images through our model. So we need to do warm up before we go in and basically just measure the model's performance, but also before we measure the latency of our model. Then we also need to make sure that we optimize the inference engine. So it could be that you run on specific GPU architecture, make sure that you have the latest versions, compatible versions and so on. So it could be GPU drivers, if you're using CPU and so on, just make sure that you're on the latest drivers and all of it is compatible together. And also the same as when you were training the models. You can also go in and use asynchronous processing. So again, if you have large workflow, you can actually like just have it run in asynchronous mode, depending on the use cases, projects, and so on that you're doing. So you can actually like have multiple inferences running at the same time. So profile the inference pipeline. It's always good to like profile everything, monitor everything. So if there's anything causing delays for the inference speed, could not just be like the model. So make sure that if you're doing some pre-processing steps, post processing steps and so on could be that the errors isn't there and why you're actually like seeing longer inference time. Also make sure that you use an appropriate precision for your model weight. So it could be that you're running floating point 32 when you deploy the model, but you were actually like expecting to use floating point 16. So that will also increase this inference speed significantly because then you're basically just having double precision and it takes longer to process the images if you're using floating point 32 compared to floating point 16 or even in eight. So make sure that you're using the precision that you expected as well. To end off the video here, let's just talk about some security considerations when you want to do your model deployments. So make sure that you have secure data transmissions, especially if you have local deployment, you send your images to your own on-prem server, or even if you send it to a cloud deployment, make sure that you have the data secured. Could be that you have an encrypted protocol like the transport layer. So basically just encrypt all the data being transmitted before running the inference. And if you have that, you're pretty much good to go. You just have this end-to-end -end encryption. So this basically just makes sure that your data is secure. Even if someone actually like get access to the data, they won't be able to read it if you're using this end-to-end -end encryption. So you can also set up different access controls to your model deployment environment and so on, depending on what you're using, edge device, cloud solutions, and so on. You can have multi-factor authentication, set up role-based access control and so on, just to make sure that the permissions are correct for the different user roles and so on. So that is also very important once you do model deployment. So the last one here is also a pretty good one to do. So that is model authentication. So protecting your model from being reverse engineered or misused can also be done through this specific technique here. So we can actually just go inside the model parameters and encrypt them, both the weights and also the biases, which makes it very hard for people who has gotten access to your model to reverse engineer it. It basically just means that we go in and add dummy layers, dummy weights and so on to your model. So it's harder to read, understand and also reverse engineer in general. But you can also go in and set up like secure model environment where you're deploying your model. So that could be like using a trusted execution environment. And that is just another layer that you can put on top of your inference. So it really depends on if you're done a local edge or cloud deployment. So I hope you learned a ton throughout this video here. These are the best practices for model deployment and basically just taking our models from our Jupyter notebook once we have done all the development and put it into production because at the end of the day, we need to have our AI models, update taking models, provide value, do useful work out in the real world. I hope you learned a ton. Definitely check out the other videos that we have on the channel and also make sure that you remember these best practices. Watch the video again or going to read about it in our documentation. I hope to see you guys in one of the upcoming videos. Until then, happy learning.